All right, I got the recording going. All right, so I'll give it back to you now. Hopefully it won't stop my recording. Okay, there we go. We're back in business now. All right, so since you came back, I'll keep talking to you. All right, so the others are probably waiting on it to reload into the into the group, which is fine. So I promise I'm getting all this figured out. Uh, it's a learning curve. So we just talked about radiation. So now let's about stem cell transplant. And so stem cell transplantation, you're gonna see is very common in our blood cancers because what it does is it actually goes in and it'll replace stem cells that get destroyed by chemo or radiation. And it's becoming actually very popular because stem cells, what we have found through research is stem cells can be created into anything. So we can make stem cells basically do our bidding for the most part um, and make a, make a whole new system. And so you've got two different types. You've got a bone marrow transplant and then you have what's called a peripheral blood stem cell transplantation most commonly used in leukemia and lymphomas. Uh, we have a couple of different donor cells. We have allogenic, we have syngenetic, and then we have autologulus. Okay, so those are the three different types of these stem cell transplants. And so allogenic is typically, um, a donor that is a sibling or a parent that has similar tissue types or it could even also be somebody that's not related to the client but long story short they have very similar tissue types where a syngenetic are stem cells from identical twins which would be a little less common but they do happen and then we have those autologulus um, which are the most common type and this is where the client will actually receive his or her own stem cells. These stem cells are actually harvested during a disease remission and then they are stored frozen. And so the key here is those stem cells being stored frozen. So if you're being asked to transfuse them because they come to you frozen, they would need to be thawed first. Um, <laughs> but there's this term called conditioning. And what conditioning means is it's an immunosuppression therapy regimen that is used to eradicate or get rid of all of the malignant cells, all of the cancer cells. What happens is it provides a state of immunosuppression. It'll create space in the bone marrow for engraftment of the new marrow to come in. Okay. I think of conditioning or really this whole um, theory of stem cell transplant, this literally is resetting your immune system, okay? Because it gets rid of everything that's bad, it gets rid of all the cancer, and it resets the immune system. It was actually described to me one time as having an immune system of an unborn fetus. So you think is the if um, for those of you that have gone through women and children's health, um, you know a brand new baby as it's forming in the womb as a fetus, all these organ systems begin to develop. They have a very immature immune immune system until it becomes of age, and so people who receive this hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, they have it. Um, a reboot of their immune system. They're just like a brand new baby all over again. And so it takes time for these cells to take and to mature, and it's a reset of the entire immune system. It's actually very cool. Um, Duke is probably one of the major medical facilities within North Carolina that are doing it with success. Um, the biggest thing is um, there's this, this um, kind of where we're trying to get to and that's called engraftment and this is when the stem cells actually move into the marrow it actually begins um, to restore the white blood cell counts the platelet counts all of that all of that good stuff and it takes about two to five weeks 
and it's really important because while we're kind of waiting for this engraftment to take, we're waiting for the immune system to reboot and do its thing, these patients are at a high, high risk for infection and bleeding, okay? Infection and bleeding are the two big things after this cell transplantation. So you have to limit visitors. You have to know no fresh flowers, no fresh anything, um, because you run the risk of introducing more germs into that immune system. So these are literally just like a brand new baby, frequent hand washing. You don't want a lot of people handling these patients. Um, there's this term that I, I think it's old school because I don't see it in any of the text anymore, but we used to call it reverse um, isolation. I think now it's called protective isolation, but essentially I put on gloves, gown, and mask because I don't want to give this brand new immune system any germs to process. So those are the big things that you need to know with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. I know that's a lot of information, so um, if you have questions, by all means, please speak up um, or drop it in the chat either way. I've got my lovely assistant handling things on the side while I'm still talking here. Um, so a couple of the major things that are bound to happen after these stem cell transplants is we have a failure to engraft, which means the immune system never really reboots. The stem cells don't take like they're supposed to. And so then we have this state of uh, neutropenia, which, I mean, I guess in the worst case scenario, it's the same position that they've been in the whole time. But of course, it is not ideal. The other thing that we have on the screen, and I'm going to get back to graft versus host disease, is this hepatic veno occlusive disease. Hepatic veno occlusive disease. And what happens in hepatic veno occlusive disease is it's, I mean, it's really in the name, right? So it's an occlusion of the hepatic veins because there's either a thrombosis or it's a phlebitis situation, <clears throat> okay? But the big one here that we need to talk about is graft versus host disease because that is the next kind of big complication that we need to worry about, okay? And in graft versus host disease, um, what happens is the body can't recognize those donated stem cells. And so the body detects them as being foreign or not of myself. So then there becomes a total immune response because the body's like, hey, wait a second, what's going on here? These are not mine. And so then what happens is um, you have this delicate balance of suppressing the immune system, but you don't want to suppress the brand new immune system too much because then you put them up for infection and you will actually cause them to not engraft anymore. So then we can turn into the first one, which is failure to engraft. So graft versus host disease, that is essentially when the body doesn't recognize them as their own because the stem cells are not, right? They come from a, from a donor of some sort. Um, again, this is probably the most common in, um, you know, when we talk about the different ones that we have in the previous slide, let's see if I can go back here. Ooh, too far. It's most common in the allogenic, because remember the syngenetic would be an identical twin, which can happen, but it's not that common. And then the autologulus are the ones where I'm actually donating to myself. All right, so let's get in and talk about a couple of these cancers, um, not to keep you too long because it is Saturday and I'm sure you guys have something better to do, although if you're in nursing school, that probably means studying, but leukemia. Leukemia, very simply put, are blood cancers or hematological malignancies if you want to get fancy. What happens is the body overproduces too many lymphocytes. They don't have an opportunity to mature. These are also called blast cells. And so what happens is there's a high number of immature lymphocytes hanging out in the blood, the bloodstream. You have two major types. You have lymphocytic and myelocytic. That just means uh, which pathway they start out at. 
doesn't really change, but um, when you go to labeling like AML or ALL, that's the difference between the two. Your biggest risk factors here are genetics. Again, it's that genetic mutation that's passed on from parents, or there's some sort of chemical or radiation exposure or environmental factors. So some of the very common things that you're gonna find with these patients are loss of appetite, fatigue, weakness, and weight loss. They are going to be anemic because again, their blood cell counts are, cannot be sustained. They are a bleeding risk they are an infection risk. Um, so increased temperature, enlarged lymph nodes, enlarged spleen, enlarged liver, those are all indications that we have an infection going on. Tachycardia, hypotension, again, if they are bleeding somewhere on the inside, these are initial changes in the body with bleeding. Dyspnea, they have trouble breathing, and then again, abnormal blood count. Again, all very common symptoms. So when it comes to uh, NCLEX and nursing tests, you want to think infection, you want to think bleeding, and you want to think fatigue. Let me just, all right. So infection, again, you're looking for all those signs and symptoms of infection, enlarged lymph nodes, temperature, extreme fatigue, not feeling well. They are a bleeding risk. So if you have a patient with leukemia that's having bloody stool, bloody diarrhea, they become a high priority patient, okay, because we're worried about some sort of bleeding in the gut. And again, this is because their blood counts are off. And then fatigue, they're going to get tired easy because they don't have the circulating blood cells that they're supposed to have because they've got all this cancer circulating throughout their body. So you think fatigue. So breathing is going to be an effort. Activities of daily living will be an effort. Um, so frequent rest periods are always good for these patients. These are all common things that the NCLEX and nursing tests like to test, test you on. Can you identify signs of infection? Can you identify that a patient with leukemia that is having some sort of bleeding, they are high priority patients, and then do we provide enough adequate rest and do we provide adequate nutrition? All right, so we will move on to lymphoma. Lymphoma is an abnormal production of lymphocytes. We have two major types. We have Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is very specific, and we have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which actually has over 60 different subtypes. Um, the foundation of both of these are essentially the same. The only difference is Hodgkin's lymphoma will start in a very specific lymph node or a chain of lymph nodes. So in our little man over here, or I suppose it could be a female as well, it may be this cluster right here or just this single lymph node, and that is very cl classic of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can actually just kind of do whatever it wants to do. It's a little less organized, which is why there's over 60 different subtypes. Lymphoma will involve directly the lymph nodes, the spleen, the tonsils, and our bone marrow, okay? And that's because the spleen and the tonsils are all considered lymph type organs. So this is what you're gonna see in these patients. Risk factors for developing lymphoma, patients who have lots of viral infections or what I term are sickly patients, lots of health issues. And what happens is the lymph system, because that's responsible for our immune response, they, it becomes overloaded, right? You can't ask your car to go 100,000 miles and never do an oil change. The same thing here. You can't ask your lymph system to fight off 10, 15, 20 infections a year and still be able to function properly. Um, I really did, really did just do an analysis of a car to your lymph system. Um, but too many viral infections will overload the lymphatic system, which will cause that breakdown in the cells to do their normal job, which is the definition of cancer. Um, our patients that we do combination chemotherapies on, again, we're attacking the lymph nodes they don't know what to do, and so a lot of times lymphoma will pop up as a secondary cancer when we've used a lot of chemotherapy. 
And then there's also chemical radiations um, or chemical exposures, I'm sorry. And I think we've all probably seen the commercial, if you've been exposed to Roundup, the weed killer, and you've been diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, you may be entitled to a lawsuit. So it's those chemical and environmental exposures. Okay, sorry, the mouse was doing its own thing there for a second. So assessment findings, again, we think about um, infection on these patients, right? Because our lymph nodes are responsible for our immunity. When they're overworked because they're dealing with cancer, you put your patient or your patients at a much higher risk for infection. So fever, tired, um, exhaustion even, weakness, night sweats, they don't want to eat, they have a significant weight loss. And again, this enlarged lymph nodes and the liver and spleen also become enlarged. So again, the primary focus for lymphoma, these are easy, easy to bleed patients as well as easy infection patients. So hand washing, good oral hygiene. Um, the majority of our lymphoma patients are young males. If you looked up the risk factors and kind of who's at high risk, there's this age range of, age range of like late teenagers to early 20s, okay? When we do radiation on these young males, we actually kill the sperm or they even become completely sterile and never regain that function. So one of the things to promote a quality of life for them later on in life is to encourage sperm banking. All right, we will move on to lung cancer. So lung cancer is a malignant tumor of the bronchii, bronchioles, whatever you wanna say, and or lung tissue. Lung cancer is a very common site for METs, okay? A lot of times lung cancer will start out somewhere else and become a metastasis. And these are always based on cell tissue type. It can be non-cell or small cell or non-small cell carcinomas. It can be epidermal. It can be adenocarcinoma or it can be large cell. The biggest, biggest risk factor for lung cancers become cigarette smoking environmental and occupational pollutants. So again, if you work in a factory where you inhale a lot of chemicals, you are at higher risk for lung cancer. Uh, asbestos, cigarette smoking, those are big, big risk factors for cancer. Things that you're gonna find in lung cancer, very, very early on, they can be very vague symptoms. Oh, I just have a cough, just doesn't seem to go away. That's a red flag. Or I get real short of breath when I'm just walking up the stairs. I've always walked up those stairs. Very vague symptoms. Um, other assessment findings may be wheezing, hoarseness, hemoptysis, which is blood in the sputum, chest pain, anorexia or weight loss, weakness, and then diminished or absent breath sounds. Particularly as you get further and more advanced, these symptoms will continue to worsen. Focus, it's the lungs, so it's always going to be about the airway, it's always going to be about the breathing. Whenever you're asked about nursing interventions, you always want to think what's going to improve oxygenation. What are things that I can do as the nurse to improve this patient's oxygenation? It could be administer oxygen, it could be sitting them in a high Fowler's position, it could be having them cough and deep breathe. These are all common things that you would want to, um, or high priority things you would want to do for them. Uh, also, again, these are just like our lymphoma and our leukemia patients. They get tired easy, so you want to provide rest periods. There are a couple of different surgical interventions. Um, the biggest one is going to be preparing for a chest tube. If your patient has a partial lobectomy, which is where they take part of the lobe of the lung out, you can't anticipate that there will be a chest tube. So a very common question on nursing tests and on NCLEX are going to be something about chest tube management. Now, here's a little hint. You don't even need to know about their lung cancer. The moment you see chest tube and it's something with a chest tube, your brain should instantly start to think, this is more about management of the chest tube. So start thinking about that. 
pain management, this is a big one. When people can't breathe, they are in pain. Okay, and that's part of that oxygen exchange. If I'm not bringing enough oxygen in, which means I'm not oxygenating my cells, that means they're lacking those nutrients, which means they're gonna be painful because what's happening is some tissue death. Okay, and then again, remember about positioning of your patient. All right, a little bit about breast cancer. Breast cancer is an overgrowth of breast tissue, more specifically in our mammary ducts and cells. We have an invasive type, which means it leaves the tissue surrounding the mammary duct and actually goes to other parts of the breast. Um, it's very common for these patients to have mets to the brain, to the lungs, to the liver, to the bone. Um, because I want you guys to think about it too. If you go back a couple of slides, and I'm not trying to like back up, I know you guys want to get some stuff, other stuff done. Um, which is the nice part about recording this because you can always come back to it. Um, but if you look at all the lymph nodes, where are clusters of lymph nodes out, are throughout our body? We have breast tissue right here. What do we have right beside breast tissue? We have lymph nodes. If we have bladder cancer, what are we real close to? Lymph nodes, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, all down here, uterine cancer, colon cancer. Once the cancer reaches the lymph nodes, it can go anywhere, guys. Look, once it hits that lymph system, it can literally go anywhere. So when you're thinking about METs, metastases, METs, whatever you want to call them, when you're thinking about signs and symptoms, think how easily these cancers can travel through the body, it literally. A snap of the finger. All right, so I'm off of that soapbox. So let's talk about risk factors of breast cancer. It's age, primary family history, mom, brothers, sisters, um, daughters, sons, anywhere in that very primary family history, an early age of periods, late menopause, because your body's being exposed to excess estrogen, and that's where breast cancer comes from. Um, obesity and any sort of radiation exposure of the chest or other ones. Cancer findings. Remember when I talked about pain just a little bit ago in breast cancer, the mass is commonly found in the upper outer quadrant, so closer to the armpits. They can also be found beneath the nipple or in the axillary or the armpit. These are typically fixed, which means we can't move them. They're irregular masses and very early breast cancer is not painful. You may see that there's breast asymmetry. There may be clear or bloody nipple discharge. You can see skin dimpling or this co de orange or orange peel skin and lymphedema because again, you have a nice little lovely set of lymph nodes right underneath your armpits, which sit very closely to your breast. And so it's not uncommon for those lymph ducts to become occluded because of a breast mass, and therefore you have lymphedema. Oh, we're on surgical interventions already. So there's a couple of different ways that we can intervene surgically for breast cancer. One would be a lumpectomy. That's where they just go in and they remove the um, tumor itself. There's a possibility of a lymph node dissection, but that may or may not always happen. We have a simple mastectomy where the breast is removed. That means the breast tissue and the nipple, but the lymph node remains intact. And then we have a radical mastectomy. That's where the breast, nipple, and lymph nodes are all removed, but the muscle remains intact. And it becomes important because when there is a radical mastectomy, you then have the lymph nodes removed, which means if I have a left-sided radical mastectomy, that means no more blood pressures, no more vena punctures, no more invasive procedures on that left arm unless absolutely necessary. And that is because you don't have those lymph nodes there anymore to drain fluid. Remember the purpose of the lymph system is to drain fluid. And if you don't have that ability to drain out of that arm anymore, if you cause damage to that arm, if you cause inflammation to that arm, 
you will then get swelling in that arm, which then turns into pain, which then turns into a problem. Okay, so mastectomies, it's very important to know whether or not they had lymph nodes removed. And that's based on terminology here, lumpectomy, simple or radical. The other thing too, is a lot of these patients will leave the hospital with JP drains, those Jackson Pratt drains to that mastectomy site and it's important to know JP drain care, okay? So again, the stem of your question, because again, nursing tests and NCLEX like to do this, they give you this whole scenario about this mastectomy, and then it says the patient going home with JP drains needs to know which of the following information. And guys, it just boils down to a JP drain, okay? We know a JP drain doesn't need to be kinked. We know that the odor shouldn't be like, foul, infectious smelling. Um, we know that they stay in place, okay? If I hop in the shower, they shouldn't just fall out on their own. So this is very basic JP drainage information, all right? Um, I think that's all the slides that I put together for you guys. It is um, because I wanted you to, to understand kind of the basics of cancer and the different types of cancer. But I also want you to draw to take home with you today and understand is that all cancer starts with an unregulated cell growth and division. Okay. Once you understand that basic principle of cancer, you can then understand. I don't know why I'm scrolling through. It would have been easier just to do this. Um, when once you get that foundation, you actually then begin to understand um, no matter where it's at, I can, I can know, like I can process, I can critically think about the things that I need to know, okay? Because if it's in the breast, I know it's the breast tissue. What's there? What are my risk factors? What do I need to look for? In lung cancer, it's gonna turn into an oxygenation issue, always and forever. Um, you know, it just really doesn't matter. It, it's all about processing what's happening in the body and what are my high priority assessments that I need to do for this patient. Um, the only thing I didn't cover for you guys tonight would be skin cancer. Um, and so I just wanna verbally tell you about skin cancer. Again, it's on the surface, your high risk factors are that sun exposure, the radiation exposure, uh, patients, that receive radiation therapy for one type of cancer are at risk for skin cancer wherever those radiation beams hit. Um, your biggest thing for skin cancer is looking for irregularities, uh, changes in the skin, or I've got a mole that didn't look like that last year. So like I said earlier, skin inspection is a big thing because you know your body better than anybody else. So you would know if that mole was different looking, okay? So when they become irregular in shape, when they change color, like a bluish, purplish color, those are all red flags that something's going on with that skin. If you have a suspicious looking skin lesion, the one thing that you're always going to want to do is get a biopsy, okay? So you need to prepare for a biopsy of that area um, because, let me see if I can stop sharing here. There you guys are. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all I have for you guys. Oh, I was wrapping up with skin. So you'd wanna do a biopsy. Um, 